Starliner Media. Starliner Media presents Music Night at the Majestic with your host, Michael Boswell. All right, it's time once again for Music Night at the Majestic. And with us tonight, Jeff Berlin. Jeff, welcome to the show. Thank you, Michael. Thanks for having me. I appreciate being here. It's always fun to talk about music. That I love. Well, it, it, that that's the whole point of this of this show, is talking about music. Right so, on. Now, for you, did you grow up in a musical household that kind of instilled this passion for you? Yes. Uh, my father was uh, an opera singer. And my mother was, I would say, naturally musically gifted. I, it, they talk about the, the DNA passing on. I think I got it from her, although my father was quite a successful up-and-coming opera singer. So there was always classical music in the house. Uh, they saw, yeah, you know, uh, they, their son Jeff had a, had a propensity for music. I was singing and banging out notes on a piano. So I started on violin when I was five and was given a, a good young background training in the instrument and in classical music which which uh benefits me to this day yeah well actually was it on uh crossroads that you had uh bach yes uh, interestingly if i if i can remember correctly i might have been the first proponent of recording a bach piece i think that doing the c minor prelude uh, one, I like arranging music. I like taking pieces that are known in a common pattern, you know, how it turns out and that people expect it to from hearing it all their lives and then maybe doing things to it to make it unique. So I took the C minor prelude, which is a two handed uh, composition by Bach, and I assigned myself the bass clef and assigned guitar and piano uh, the upper clef. And as I recall, I, I, I kind of sometimes I go back and think about these things, and I, I think I'm pretty proud of that. I mean, Jocko did uh, what was it called, Chromatic Fantasy, which I think followed my record. Um, and before Bach, I don't recall if anybody was playing it or recorded it. So I, I have a little bit of pride in maybe having opened a door for the bass players to consider the great music of this legendary composer. Yeah. Yeah, that's 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 the standout track for me. We rocked it, and then I changed the harmony because the C, the, the piece is in C minor, and I think we went to A minor for solos. I wrote a little interlude, which I always like doing, and then result. It's almost jazz typical harmony, but done in with a classical music set in rock and roll of sonics. Well, yeah, that's that's one of the things I've said in this show before is the integration of, of multiple styles, genres, whatever you want to you know, call it, yeah, into a single piece always intrigues me. This way, yeah, because you get all the different flavors uh, on it. And to me, when somebody is you know, going to do a new version or a cover version, whatever you want to call it, uh, one thing I can't stand is like a note-for-note -note take on something. Mm -hmm. You got to bring some, you got to put yourself into that song so mm -hmm. to make it unique and which you know you obviously you have done your version of tears of yeah in heaven yeah you know, is a prime example uh yeah. on that oh thanks so, but uh that that to to jump around much but to digress so you, you start out on a violin mm -hmm. how did you wind up uh playing bass oh well the beatles came up uh 1964 they came to America. I was about 11 at that time. And I already was losing a feeling for the violin or the, the practice. It takes, takes a lot of practice. And uh, th their, their stage presence, the songs, uh, they, they got to me as they did to everybody else. And being that I'm a trained musician, pretty well, even as a child, I understood the function of music from different levels, the physical instrument, the actual construction of music. But you realize lots of kids were like me. I wasn't special in that. That's, <coughs> <excuse me. coughs> That's how they taught back then. 
to where we, we would learn how to play. Anyway, so the Beatles made it clear that I was never going to be a classical violinist, which my family said, oh, our son, the violinist. They couldn't say our son, the doctor. So second best <laughs> was our son, the violinist. So, yeah. And uh, I noticed that the bass had the same name strings, E-A-D-G. The violin has the same strings, E-A-D-G. The difference is the bass from low to high is a low E going up A-D-G. And the violin from low to high going up is G-D-A-E. And what that means is that the bass is tuned in fourths where the violin is tuned in fifths. But that didn't throw me. I had the idea that since I was already practicing Mendelssohn, let's say, and rather reasonably sophisticated uh, classical literature that I would be able to undertake a self-taught re uh, regard of the bass and, and figure it out. And uh, it took a minute. I mean, I, I wasn't used to the, the instrument. I had to teach myself how to play it. Yeah. Well, the, tell, tell me this, yeah, the, the bass stylistically uh, playing, I should say style has uh -huh. changed dramatically over the oh. last 50 years. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. What's, what's your take on that? And where do you see the, the uh, impetus for that? Well, I think each generation rises upon the shoulders of the generation that preceded it. I came up standing on the shoulders of Jack Bruce and Jack Cassidy and Tim Bogart and Paul McCartney and uh, Jamerson, uh, uh, John Entwistle. So when I heard those basses in those settings, it gave me an understanding of the function of bass at that time, but allowed me to take other sort of inspirations because I was always a curious young musician and try to do new things just for my own entertainment. I think that's why Jocko was such a special musician that the things he created uh, – I may be simplifying the definition were probably created because he was curious about it. You know, what's that? Oh, look at that. Oh, what if I pulled a fret out? What if I did a harmonic? You know, uh, it's it. the genius, I suppose, might be best seen as a curiosity that has been fulfilled. And uh, that's why when I came along and had that sort of young ferocious technique and 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 uh, i couldn't keep still in the harmony it lost me many gigs where people wanted a bass player and i was not prone to being a bass player of course i am now but at that particular time if i could was asked to play da 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 i said oh why don't i do da 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 and it that lack of professionalism is why I'm not on a lot of the records that I originally was asked to be on because I didn't have the maturity or understanding to play a job appropriately. Anyways, in my sort of curiosity of bass, I did some stuff that was kind of creative. Stanley Clark did stuff that was creative. And then uh, from what Jocko Stanley or maybe me or, or, or basis of that era did, kids came along, heard us, and said, so, hmm, why don't I do this? And then so on and so on. So that's today you have the most outstanding group of bass players who technically are incomparable. We are in, but they are in, they're beyond us. We can't be compared to them. Their technique is out of the door. It is stunning, simply unbelievable. And uh, I'm, certain that it's because they heard whatever preceded them and then they said well why don't i try to do something else maybe do it better and i'm curious what that what some 10 11 or 12 year old person right now might end up sounding like considering the the brilliant basis that they're listening to today yeah. you know you, you know something uh, i'll give if, if i may it when i do let's say bass seminars or bass classes I generally aim toward giving people things that they might not have an easy time finding by listening to the great bass players. Great bass players don't precisely know why they do what they do. 
they evolved into it. What I've discovered is, is that since the beginning of music, practically, let's let you, let's keep it even more simple. The beginning of the 20th century in America, the New Orleans beginning jazz, and then look at, looking at each subsequent decade, and then the, the small bands and Louis Armstrong, and then the, uh, what, 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 who's the clarinetist? Uh, Goodman, Benny Goodman, and then rock and roll, Fats Domino, the 60s, the Beatles, and just go all the way up to today. All those musical styles have the same harmony just about it's all based in g major or e major or f or you know what i mean mm -hmm. and that i think is the one element that when new bassists want to learn how to play that that ought to be included in what they're being shown because they can already do this but often don't know what they're doing nor why so that's something that i recognize having been taught i don't know if i'm going explaining this weirdly but i'm I like to show people what they don't know because they already can play better than I can. Yeah. Tell me this, Jeff, what was one of the first records you got where when you heard it, you heard the bass part and were just totally blown away by it. Well, uh, McCartney certainly, but essentially McCartney was a songwriter and a singer who played the bass. So, the the impact of his bass on me was less than the impact that Jack Bruce provided on me. Because Jack, it's it, certainly in the live cream period, the, the period when uh, Wheels of Fire came out, produced two songs in particular on that record, uh, which is Crossroads, where... I know this for a fact that none of us ever heard anything like what he played on the bass on that song. Four minutes of blues bass that is utterly without precedence. The second one was his long improv on E minor on Spoonful. And it took our instrument to a place that was unimaginable at that time. And it only happened because it, 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 it was uh, amongst three equals. Uh, three equal players of, of the same philosophy of music. So, um, if you if you want to know what record is that your question? What record totally put me down? You know, what, uh, for the count, right? Wheels of Fire, Crossroads, and Spoonful. Those are the two. Huh, those are the two tracks that changed my life. That made me know that I was here to play. Tell me this, Jeff. What was the the most recent? album or yeah, you know, song that you've heard where you were really knocked out by the bass playing uh online uh there's a young lady and i can't remember her name uh for sheer technique modine day moda day. i can't remember her name well i don't remember songs because I, I i haven't i if I buy records, I buy a Deutsche Grammophone or, or, or buy things like this. Um, um, there's a couple of great bassists. I'll go right with Hadrian Farad, who I think is the greatest technically untouchable bassist on planet Earth. Um, what is her name? Day. Her last name is Day. Young lady, an Indian lady, I believe, who has more ferocity. When I say ferocity, I mean physical ability. There's a guy named Leo in France who's the same. There's so many guys now. So it's not an album as much as what I find online, that these guys are just, that they make us all look like beginners. Yeah, t tell me this, were, when uh, you were younger, were you a big record collector? Yes, and I listened to them and ate them up. I ate them up to the degree that, Oh, well, uh, an example, uh, uh, Ron Bumblethall, when we met at an AM show, uh, we chatted about Beatles and we sat down and I had the bass, he had a, an acoustic. And without rehearsing, we, we played the, the second side of Abbey Road together. You know, all nice. those little parts and stuff. And, and it's all in the, in, in the gray matter, you know. I mean, it, it, we've heard it so much that the only uh, limit to, to playing it is actually playing it. So which sort of goes with my ethic that music begins uh, before an instrument and the instrument sort of serves 
getting it out. But uh, yeah, I used to listen to every record. I got very good at listening. I mean, now I listen to I listen a lot to uh, uh, Daniel Barenboim, who's my favorite conductor, and I'll listen to different interpretations of his sim- Beethoven symphonies. And then maybe I'll go to another guy like uh, Ricardo Muti, and and listen to his and notice the difference. Notice the oboe over here played this way, but didn't play this way on on the uh, Barenboim. So my hearing has gotten quite acute just by the being in it. Um, mm-hmm. I hear stuff. I hear more than I can play, interestingly. Yeah. Well, since we've touched on the Beatles, favorite Beatles album? Right now, Abbey Road. Abbey Road. But how do you, how do you really isolate them? I mean, you could go right to uh, Sgt. Pepper, but there's something about Abbey Road that uh, made, made me feel it's like the greatest great record they ever put out don't know why well you know what for, for, for me it, it if somebody were to ask me you know what's your favorite album of theirs it would depend on what day they catch me on yeah Cause some because some days it's like you know what i'm all in on rubber soul other days abby road you know so yeah. i mean it's just just a matter of you know you know what what mood you're ready kind of like you know what you what you know, kind of music you want to listen to at any given point in time correct Correct. Yeah. Sure, it, it it varies. I uh, the reason that I picked Abbey Road is because I listened to some of the vocal harmonies, uh, a cappella, and like what they did on Because I heard the demo of Because John Lennon's demo, and it was relatively un, unimpressive. So, guy on an acoustic guitar, what was it? Because and da 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 da, and you know that's the the, the the early makings of it. But when you hear those three vocal harmonies, I'm curious how much George Martin had a hand in it or if they just did it on their own or if it was a combined thing. But those harmonies and then the, the vocal harmonies, the acapella on, on um, Sun King, yeah, it's, it's just glorious. So, yes, Abbey, Abbey Road sticks out for me. Yeah, you're not going to get an argument from me. Nah, right. Well, tell you, you mentioned before about uh, studio work, session work, what have you. What are some of the the the, the uh, sessions that you played on that are most memorable for you? My earlier ones were uh, session work is mostly gone. I uh, people don't call me uh, for stuff anymore because of two reasons. One, I think they believe that all I want to do is solo. And uh, I haven't had an opportunity in all these years to say I really enjoyed just playing bass properly, come up with a good part, good sounds. So I accept that. That's why I sort of pursue my own thing more. But in the early days, I did a, a I did tons of sessions. Memorable. The the Bill Bruford records were standouts. Uh, 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 Alan Holdsworth was a standout. Um, I did a couple of records for, uh, and I like this little bit. It's a little sneaky, sneaky. They uh, sort of sworn me to secrecy regarding replacing a bass part for a quite a well-known bass, a well-known band. And I kept that promise because I keep my words. Um, and so uh, there's bass parts that some may know and that uh, I'll never share that it's me. But I've done other, I did a whole bunch of the CTI sessions in the 70s and L.A., gosh, I mean, I did quite a bit. Um, They fade because I got more into my thing and did my own solo records, did about eight or nine of them now, and uh, pursued my educational teaching and tours Jeff Berlin, except after COVID, I was off for two and a half years. Yeah, everybody was. (laughs) So, now, uh, you you played... uh, uh some stuff with with Frank Zappa, correct? Yeah. Um, there's a, a part of my life, which is, uh, I call it uh, pre-therapy, psychotherapy, and post-psychotherapy. And uh, I've been struggling all my life with proper behavior, proper conduct, uh, a way to be without the ego or the criticism 
that came to me so naturally because I was raised in it. Some people dealt with it and fixed it in their lives, and some people uh, are still challenged by it. And I was challenged even up until recently. I had such an epiphany because I go to therapy still. And uh, I mentioned that because with Frank, I got in the band and then pulled some egotistical stuff like, I, you know, can I get more money? And I, <laughs> I talked to the therapist about these things, and I said, look at all the things that I had done to sabotage and do these ridiculously poor thought out stuff. And she said that there was no way for certain people who behaved certain ways, you can't think, oh, what if I only did it better? Because there was no way. It, it, you function according to the ability you have. So um, it's sort of an out for me, but I still deal with the sort of difficulty or the anxiety of thinking of all the, the things that I had done poorly and would never do today because I'm not that man, but oh, a lot of debt of apology and a lot of ownership that it's better to be kind and available and to follow the, the, the you know, when you, when you work with, I was always a good working partner. I never had ego in that, but this time I did. Frank's music was challenging. It wasn't exactly what I wished to do. I, uh, but that was the band, and it launched a, a lot of great talent. But uh, just to that other thing, I'm I'm still in therapy, working on trying to more get in touch with the kinder side, the the non critical side, the less hurtful side, and that counts very much with me, even at this time in my life. Yeah, tell tell me this, on uh, as you're making amends. Uh, on things is there anything that's that uh, sticks out for you that you've made a, a point of making amends with yes uh uh i've been very critical especially of uh two people who didn't deserve it steve bailey the head of the base department at berkeley for his manner of seeing how base can be taught and victor wooten who is very popular, very well loved. And I criticized their approaches because their approaches didn't match mine. Could there have been anything more stupid in, that I could have ever done? So I had a, an awareness. It's it, it, like I said, I, I'm still, I'm acting calm here, but I'm trembling inside because I'm actually going to the shrink in about, you know, when we're done a couple hours. Um, when I realized the source of these criticisms, it was entirely due to family upbringing. And I had it in me as a part of my whole life. And then surrendering this, the criticism part, left me shaken because it was all I knew. You know, I'm on the Michael show. Well, his, uh, his background is, you know, he was a nice guy, but the background it poured out of me like water. And so I unfairly and unjustifiably referred to Victor and Steve in their view of teaching acumen, which I could not have been more wrong. I could not have been more, I, what's the word, contrite in, in, in wanting to make up for it. And I've called them and I've left messages and stuff, but it's been a long time coming. I don't. I didn't apologize to get a result. I apologized to own my bad behavior, and uh, I, I'm not shy about this. I, I mean, I'm shy about it, but but uh, I want to be what I always wished I'd have been: a loving, sharing, embracing people. You do it this way, I do it that way. And we all belong and we all have something to contribute. And that, unbelievably, is a recent lesson to me. So uh, I'm, it's almost like I'm Scrooge on Christmas morning. I've apologized before, didn't stick. But uh, something happened that was very, very profound. I hope I'm not talking too long. No. Yeah. So that's the thing. I, I, I have my beliefs. I still do. But you have yours. I mean, people have their thoughts. So that critical part of me is over completely. And I do want to share. And, and from noticing it, that the variety of teaching, Victor 
personally opened doors to bass players all over the world. And Berkeley is maybe the biggest institution of its kind uh, affecting varieties of teaching. Why didn't I see this before and, and had become a, a more involved uh, member of, of base education? I'm very good at base education, very good at it, but other people are too, and they teach differently. So, you know, well, that's what it. Works for one doesn't work for another. So you got you to gotta find the path that's right for you. Yeah, and I, I regret that I didn't know that, uh, you know. I was adamant in my stupidity. Yeah. Well, but, but I realize it now, and it's 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 better late than never. When I die, I'm not going to die in the same ignorance that I lived. So, if, I mean, I that's a sort of a tenet of, of spiritualism that, you know, growth comes when it, crum when it comes. So. Right. Oh, okay. it, 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 it is one of those things. It just has to happen naturally. Yes, I, I think so. But I'll tell you, you'll never see a more contrite person in the planet than me, man. Uh, I'm, I'm going to, I have to deal with this for a while. I'm not well and just going, ah, I made a mistake. Everything's great. No, I, uh, I'm not sure where, how life will lead me to do better and to show love to people that I may have not shown love to before. There's a guy that uh, I talked to, a guy, because I've been mentioning this thing um, on other chats and other things and a guy mentioned oh there was a friend of mine who said you harmed him back in at mi back in the 80s and he told me this last night i said please send me his phone number i'm going to call him tomorrow because if i can heal the energy of anything i've done wrong so to make things better for people it'll be better for me too so i i'm sort of on this uh, you're on a mission yeah, but that sounds almost military, doesn't it? I'm, I'm, <laughs> it's sort you of like a, I, you have a cause. I, I have a calling to do better. That's I think my yeah. beetle. So there you go. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, we we uh, mentioned the Crossroads album earlier. Mm -hmm. There's another track on there that stood out to me, and that's Twenty Thousand Prayers. Oh yeah. Tell us about that. Well, I wrote it on a piano as a younger man. Um, it, it, it was one of my earlier fusion pieces, I guess you might call it. Um, I, the title merely sounded good. I guess I could have called it, you know, pretzels with mustard <laughs> or the stock, <laughs> the stock market went up today. Uh, I called it 20,000 prayers. It just seemed to have a interesting little ring to it. And I felt it was a very strong composition, uh, which I'm not a trained composer. But uh, I grew up around a lot of this music. And, you know, when, when, you, when you listen deeply, things are there. So I kind of took from here, took from there. That's how I write these days. Yeah. Well, say you, you mentioned you, know, you had the title. I really like some of the titles that you come up with, where there are plays on words or phrases. On Lumpy Jazz, you had mm -hmm. a mensch Among Unmentionables. Mm -hmm. Where How did you come up with that? I like puns, and I was playing with Richard Drexler, who was a great jazz pianist and upright bassist. He's a virtuoso on both instruments. And we both uh, enjoyed puns. We, we actually have lists of them. I, I was wondering if we should publish, like, you know, funny names. We have, like, all kinds of funny – I forgot the word for it, but it's all kinds of funny, twisted things, you know, uh, uh, that, that I should read some of them. Some of them are just great. I mean uh, – Gosh, it, it just goes out of my head, you know. Um, uh, gosh, I, I, I should... in, in Harmony's way, you had Liebman on a jet plane. That's Richards, Liebman on a jet plane. And we had Dave yeah. Liebman playing on it. Right, right, right. Yeah. And then also, uh, everybody knows you when you're up and in. <laughs> That's right. As opposed to nobody knows you when you're down and out. Down and out. Yeah, right. exactly. And then uh, uh, taking notes, you had Hello, Dolly. Hello, Dolly, <laughs> D-A-L-I. Right, right, yeah. right so but i like uh, these puns yeah well i mean they're they're fun and you know uh to to me it shows you know a sense of humor uh, especially on a style of music that is usually takes itself seriously yeah so. yeah i mean uh, a little light banter and I, it's it's sort of a, a jazz way to look at things uh there's a funny uh country music line i don't know where i heard it or where it originated but the line goes if the phone don't ring 
it's me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's the kind of thing. Well, Yogi Bearerisms in a way. Right. Yeah. Junior Brown is great for uh, doing songs like that in the uh, country vein. Mm -hmm. So he's, yeah, we're not if you're familiar with, with Junior or not, but yeah, he uh, simultaneously pays homage and then updates, you know, that, you know, 40s honky tonk style for, you know, for uh, uh, early 50s you know, stuff. So, uh -huh. But uh, uh We'd be remiss here, Jeff, if we don't get into Jack songs. You talked about Jack Bruce earlier. Let's Jack talk songs. about the new album. So now, yeah, with this, yeah, you're paying tribute to yeah your yeah, biggest influence, if you will, yes, uh, on it. And, and as I said earlier, yeah, the when when there's tribute albums, cover versions, what have you, when they do it note for note, to me, it's like yeah, I've already got the original. With this album. You, you know, take things and mix it up and make it its own, you know, on this. How did the album come about? And you've got some, some uh, pretty big friends working <laughs> on this with you as well. So t tell us the story. Well, the story was uh, several years ago, I approached John McCracken, producer John McCracken, if he wanted to record the record. And we he went to several record companies and they didn't uh take us so i financed the record and put it together with john for several years a little bit here a little bit there it began with it, the whole thing began actually inspired by I, I don't know if i'm saying his name correctly giles martin or giles martin the son of george martin uh he did a record called the beatles love that i think he produced for cirque du soleil and when I heard that and heard four, five, or six Beatles song references in one song, all in the same key and all in time, I was blown away. I didn't know how he produced this. I thought it was brilliant. So I couldn't do the same thing and extract literal tracks out of a tape or, 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 or uh, digital. So I wrote out arrangements, and I thought that really nobody would want to hear me playing dun 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 dun. So I said, why don't I combine several of the cream songs into one mel melange? Because it's it's the blue. The, those songs were basically blues. So I had uh, the bass line from "Sunshine of Your Love," while uh, I think it was uh, Ron Hemby sang the melody from uh, a, a, a politician, then we went into sleepy time time, and I decided to arrange it to make it a work. And it, it worked, the whole record work. I mean, I, I had to uh, extract music from it from a lifetime's catalog. And by doing it, I had to make sure that parts gelled or were resolved. To, to, to move from one part to another. And quite honestly, I think there's no record like it. Right now, it's it, it was pretty Herculean. I'm a bit beat up from it. It's, uh, you know, I we took pieces and parts and parts and pieces. It's, it's a Frankenstein construction. And yet, John McCracken ma managed to make it all sound organic. It literally works as a work. And that's all due to John's production. So, I have the best bass tone I've ever had. The, the players on it are some of the best guests I could have ever had. The arrangements are some of the best. And, and I don't, this is where the ego thing gets to me. I got to be very careful because I feel a musician can be proud of their project and don't mean to be saying, well, look at me, I'm the baddest and everything, you know. So as much as enthusiasm I could share is that I don't think there's a record like this out there today right at this particular time. Um, it, it has something remarkable and uh, I, I, I'll never do it again. I'm worn out. I'm exhausted. Yeah, I I, I'll never do this kind of work again, uh, not without a budget, because I am literally physically exhausted. What anybody will hear on this record has exhausted me, and I mean it. My next record is going to be, I don't know what, the blues. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, let's talk about some of the songs on there. 
you've got uh, the, the opening track creamed, which you just you just you know, talked about. Mm -hmm. uh, then you've got uh, songs from an imaginary Western. Mm -hmm. Why'd you choose that one? Well, I think outside of cream, that might be his most famous song. Um, it's a it's a stunning composition to me, an absolute representation of the Jack Bruce musical genre. And I changed it, but kept it intact. And uh, I wanted it to be special. I wanted it to be a version that maybe might be one of the finest versions of that song that anybody that knows Jack Bruce might hear this and appreciate the, the, the arrangement of it and, and the sonic power of it. Yeah. How about a letter of thanks? That's off. I don't know what, re uh, off, what record that's off uh, of. I, it might be in harmonies. way. I, I took another famous Jack song and, and changed it. I, I added great soloists like uh, uh, Pat Ber Bergson playing harmonica and uh, Michael Whitaker played a Hammond organ that's, you ought to be called Brother Michael. I mean, he smoked it. I added sections to it. I made it into a work. The thing I, I'm kind of proud of is every song on this record is a work. It isn't sort of the song is here and now the song is done. Now we'll go to the next song. Here's the next song. Now this one is done. Now we'll go to the next song. Each song, I wanted it to be an epic. This is a work. Let's go to the next one. This is, oh, this is really different. Oh, let's go to the next one. So Letter of Thanks, it, it represents Letter of Thanks. All the songs have to represent Jack's original songs, but it had to be, in my opinion, richer in arrangement and presentation and soloing and soloing. That's how come I got the guest list that I got because I knew these guys were top players and, and would lift the record ever higher. Yeah. How about Langelo Mysterioso? Well, that's a uh, nom de guerre for uh, George Harrison. He guessed it on uh, never tell your mother. She's at a tune off of uh, songs for a tailor. And I uh, combined uh, NSU, was it? Uh, da, 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 da. And, and Never Tell Your Mother and uh, made it into a, a bombastic song. Horns, Scott Henderson's guitar solo on the Cream Jam. It's the only Cream Jam we have on the record where three guys and were, you know, just flailing. Um, just as a pure dedication to playing. Um, I hardly imagined that uh, that section could be seen as a controlled, you know what I mean, record sort of solo section. I didn't solo on that. I played bass and I played it loud and, and with, with, with the effects that I used. And Scott rocked it. And we had Gary Husband on drums because he played with Jack Bruce before. So the drummer is Bruce Gutridge on the whole record. But for this section, after the horns finish, yeah, da, 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 we put in the guitar solo, the bass solo, and Gary's drums, and we turned that stuff way up. It had to rock to the moon, so that's what we tried. I think it's like it represents the flavor of a cream jam. Mm -hmm. How about uh, train time time? Well, that's my tune, and um, Jack wrote Sleepy Time Time. And he wrote a song called Train Time. Train Time is a harmonica and ginger, you know, with brushes. And so I wrote a song that I have a feeling is uh, quite representative of a train. That's sort of uh, clunky. Can, can I show it to you? Sure. Hold on. I got to get my bass. I just got to plug it in. All right. I don't know if you'll hear this. We'll find out in a second. And uh, see if you got to. Oh. Hold on. <laughs> 
I'm getting a little squirrely here, almost there. Hold on, almost there. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. Can you hear the bass? I can. See, I wanted to duplicate a train, the chug -a lug of a train. And it was a while ago, but I came up with this sort of way, this sort of double fingering. I don't know if you could hear that. Yeah. So that's what I did as a core. And then I wrote this insane, ridiculous long line that Ron Bumblefoot Fall learned and doubled with my piano, which I slowed down because I couldn't play it live. And that's how it worked. So that was train time time. And uh, I wanted it to be rocking. This record, it's, it's funny. I'm a jazz, I'm known as a jazz guy. Sorry, I'm trying to get the phone cropped up. Uh, hold on. Um, I'm known as a jazz guy, but I wanted a record to rock, to rock hard. Sorry about this, guys. My uh, phone is bouncing all over the place here. Okay. There we are. So that's what I did. Could you oh, hear that nice. that little bass part there? Yeah, absolutely. That was that's great. A chocolate, don't you get a good to do 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 a boobits, but labits, but boobits, but but tell me this, Jeff. After everything that you you know put into making this record, is there a single track that really stands out for you that you're most proud of or happiest with the way it turned out? No, not the most happy. Uh, each track turned out quite well. I mean, I hear it back and I think, you know, like I think all artists, oh, if I only did that and if I only did this, there's things I would have liked to have done better, but we were so tired at the end, we just thought maybe this is, you know, we're not going to add guitar hero. We're not going to do this this way. But each track, as I mentioned, uh, John McCracken and I commented on this afterwards. We truly believe that this record is an epic because the songs are epics. I, um, that's it's really what each song stands out on its own. It, it I don't think there's a weak song on it. Uh, um, interestingly, a guy from uh, connected with Verve, Verve Records mentioned to me that his favorite track was my last song called uh, Fuimus, uh, the, the, the ballad. And so mm -hmm. it, go figure on the, the type of things that people love. Sammy Hagar is on the record. Uh, let's name our guest list afterwards. I think people might be quite impressed. And he's flipped on it. He sang mm -hmm. on, uh, on Langelo. Yeah. Now, t t tell me this, probably the way, the way I should have uh, phrased my, my question to you there was uh, when, when, whenever you, you know, make a record or whatever creative thing that you're doing, you always hope you have expectations. You hope it will turn out a certain way. Things change as they go along and your you know, goals and expectations change from your initial expectations thoughts when you said you know what i'm going to make jack songs how much different was the end product um it was way different and better um that pleased me um there some i i guess i'm speaking for other musicians but when you listen back sometimes to your records and you get so familiar with them you're you're almost second guess is it really that good or maybe this isn't sounding as good as i thought it was that didn't happen here with me at nor nor john john mccracken we we were pretty surprised on how the music that we had originally envisioned my arrangements and his sonics 
every time we, let's say, fixed or added, I, I would write sections, different little harmonies and add them in. And we cut in a sem- I mean, I said it's a Frankenstein project. And it always got better. I mean, it, it was really quite a surprise. So uh, I think, and I'm being quite honest, that this record turned out to be nothing short of exactly what I had hoped it would be. Uh, and cannot imagine it being any more than that. I can't redo these songs anymore. So if I ever do another Jack songs or anything else, not not the project itself, but uh, uh, one or two songs, I'll never redo these songs. I, I honestly think that they're just complete, you know? And, and that might sort of explain my exhaustion about the record because I didn't rest for a long time going back, listening, critic, criticizing the music, thinking I could do it better and doing it better, uh, improving my bass tone so that it was something else. And John, after we had finished uh, doing this, he kept going back and remastered mixing the drums to make them better and better and better. And at first I said, look, John, the drums sound okay to me. And I was lucky that I didn't listen to him. Uh, he didn't listen to me because w- what he f- ended up with was better. I mean, uh, that sort of explains the, the long way around the barn to answer your question is, uh, I think this record came out better than I could have ever imagined it coming out. If that's what you yearn for. Is that what now? Is that the, and that's what, yeah, you know, what every artist you know, yearns for is to have their album come out better than what they had hoped for. I think so. Um, it's a rare, a rare occurrence. I, I can't say I really ever felt that way about any of the other solo records I've done. Some of them are impossible for me to listen to now. You know, when you when you move on to music, your ear changes. So you go back and you go, oh, what did I do? What did I do? It sort of pertains to my concept of my therapy and the, and the, my change in order to wanting to be more, you know, embracing of people and loving of people is when I go back and think about the old ways and stuff, I go, what did I do? And it, there's sort of a relationship there. The old music, what did I think about? The, the old attitudes, what did I do? Uh, maybe life regrets, you know, those type of things. But no, this record is uh, pretty much exactly what I had hoped for and then some. I, I put some co- cool keyboard sounds on certain things. Interestingly, a lot of this, this record is full of little surprises. It's sort of like Sgt. Pepper, uh, where things, if you listen long enough, things come, oh, listen, I never heard that before. And there's so many little elements, and they all fit. I can't believe what John did. They all fit. Yeah, you um, got to like it. Well, I, I, I hope I'm not over the top about it, but it did. <laughs> Well, tell, tell me this, Jeff. Uh, is there any advice you have for uh, young bass players, kids maybe just starting out? Mm. Oh, uh, yes. Um, I have some thoughts, and it pertains to bass players might consider separating art from learning. And if they can separate art from learning, they can play and be in their artful head, playing with people, jamming, whatever. But in the learning part, which is not art, they can improve on bass. So uh, this is a little solo that I had transcribed the other day of mm-hmm. Wynton Marsalis. I don't even know if you can see it or not, but um, I wrote it out. And then I'm practicing. So there's no real art in this, but it is teaching me melody and teaching me things that I would have never thought of. Okay, a lot of bassists might not do that. So you start simple with specific little pieces of music and you do a few minutes a day. It's not a detriment because it doesn't replace anything 
about the rock or funk or, or slap or the things that, that, that you love. So my suggestion is to practice and add a little bit of reading music and also listen and imitate. It's really the same story for us all. I don't think anybody ever learned an instrument in any way that can be described as unique from anybody else. Everybody, if you look at their history, jammed and played. And some also were taught the language by written music, like me, Jack Bruce was. A lot of the studio bassists are. So reading doesn't uh, not take away from you. It'll add to your life. You know, and reading music got me to learn harmony. You know what I mean? Uh, can you hear the bass? So I'm in kind of inventing and creating mode and, and it's just based on the harmony I know. That took some time to get to. So I'm, I feel free to express myself in different ways because I learned and played and that's what I encourage young bassists to do and they can do it. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, tell me this, Jeff, is there anything that uh, we wanted to touch on that we uh, haven't hit yet? Oh, I guess uh, the guests, we didn't talk about who's guesting on the record. I thought people might be excited about that. Yeah. Do you have that there or? You know what? We have uh, this little graphic here. Yeah, you, you mentioned about you know, Sammy being on there. Mm -hmm. And then Alex and Getty from, mm -hmm. uh, uh, from Rush. Oh, I see it there. Yeah. Yeah. Alex Lice. Oh, look at that. You do. You have Billy Sheehan in there. Yes, you do. Yeah. Michael Leake from uh, Snarky Puppies. Yep. Yeah, they they uh, they couldn't fit everybody in because they're the uh, in one scroll. There's oh. too many characters to name everybody. So they're, so they're, they're all characters. <laughs> yeah. So they they we had to go with with the, who we could fit on the scroll. Okay. So, but yeah, but go ahead. Tell tell everybody you know the uh, uh, who's on there and any uh, uh, interesting stories about recording with them for the album. Well, like I said, everybody was patchwork. So I would uh, we had the rhythm section done. We had everything finished. Then we'd send it to Sammy, for example. Sammy is an example for me of an exceptionally generous and loving guy because at his stage in his career, he didn't have to do a, you know, a bass player's uh, rendition of a song, but he dedicated time. He did this thing. I told him I owe him. All these guys have an affinity for Jack. They loved cream. They're friends of mine and, and put in some time. I have a lot of little IOUs that I owe for these guys. So Alex Lifeson, I, I was very good friends with the Rush guys because they're lovely gentlemen. It just, it just turns out we were all compatriots and we had fun hanging during the heyday of Rush. Neil and I were very good friends until we unfortunately lost it. So, yeah, I ran in good circles, but with good people. So Sammy doing it and Alex doing it and Getty doing it. These are signs of love. You know, Johnny Highland, he's he's the guitarist that may be the most ferocious on the record. I, I, I you know, these are phenomenal musicians, all of them. And I got very fortunate to have them to come and participate in Jackson's. I really did. They, they made the record better. Yeah. No, and, and you you can when you listen to the record, mm -hmm. you can hear the passion of everybody involved. Very cool. Very cool, Michael. I uh, that's far out. That you just nailed what a good record should be. Passion. That's Could, that's what it's about. Mm -hmm. Passion. Yeah. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. That's yeah. a high compliment, buddy. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, on that note. <laughs> you see, I'm canceling therapy today. That's it. <laughs> I'm cured. My... <laughs> <laughs> All right, for the next session. <laughs> All right, Jeff, I'll tell you what, now that we've uh, we made sure we uh, talked about Sammy and Alex and Getty and all those guys, is there anything else that you want to make sure that we uh, cover here in this episode? Well, I'm touring a, a bass class um, coming up very soon, and I'm, I'm going to go to cities, and uh, once we locate places to, to do this, I'm going to do bass classes um it's a charged event i'm i'm charging for it like a base lesson but the uh the base lessons or the fees pay my uh, travel and take care of the expenses and the idea is is that i want to get bass players who might not have an, a, a way to figure out certain elements of their bass i'll give them months of stuff to practice in one afternoon and stuff generally applies to everybody the beginners are welcome and it's called uh, just jeff space lab i think or jeff space class I, I it'll go up line soon and it's so that people that can't come to me i'll go to you and uh next year i'm also touring jack songs and next year i'm doing a jet to or touring a jazz trio so um, this uh, is my, these are my three projects that I'm uh, involved in, but I'm not, I have a lot of music that I wrote out, but I can't bring myself to arrange for the next record yet. I'm still a bit exhausted from Jack songs. I am actually weary. It's, it's uh, <laughs> to get to compose again. My mind is a bit fried. Now that just shows that you poured your heart and soul into the album. Thank you. It pretty much. I mean, I, I listened at such a high top level and worked on that note and, and changed things so much that I'm kind of worn out from it. I need a recovery period. Yeah. So, but uh, all right. Sounds good. We'll tell you what uh, we've had uh, throughout the show, Jeff, you uh, links to your website and all your social media platforms, the YouTube channel, all that. And then uh, so folks can uh, uh, find you that way. So uh -huh. uh, thank you. Thank you for taking the time to, to join us on the show. Oh, gosh. Thanks, Michael. And thanks, everybody. Thank you for listening. All right, everybody. On that note, we'll wrap this one up. Everybody, have a good night. Cheers. This has been Music Night at the Majestic with Michael Boswell. If you enjoyed this edition of Music Night at the Majestic, follow us on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, and at musicnight.net. Music Night at the Majestic is a copyright production of Starliner Media. Any use of the accounts and descriptions of this program, its audio or visual content, without the express written consent of Starliner Media is prohibited. Thank you for joining us this evening. We'll see you next time for Music Night at the Majestic. This is your announcer speaking.